So today I welcome um, attorney Arthur Bergeron from Myrick O'Connell, and he's an elder care expert. And mm. youth, I'll give you that. He'll, he's, he may not give me the expert, but I'm going to call him an expert in his field. And um, I want to thank him for coming today and giving us this talk about home is where the heart is. So I turn it over to Arthur, and I'll speak a little bit toward uh, the middle of the presentation. Thank and you I know Jen's going, to be, Jen's going to be talking a little bit about Orchard Hill, and thank you very much, Jen, for inviting me. So we're doing this as an experiment. We're going to, we, we had talked about perhaps doing a series of programs here at Orchard Hill on a variety of topics that are important to seniors, but the obvious one to start with was this one, was just talking to folks um, who, who may be considering um, um, assisted living or who haven't been and really, but maybe, want, maybe should be. So, the folks I'm going to talk about here, so for folks who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm, a, I'm an attorney. I'm at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, there are 70 of us. There are 40 in Worcester. There are 20 in Westboro and about 10 in Boston. So we're the largest firm in Central Mass. Everybody gets to do what they like because there are so many of us and I like this. I do nothing but elder law because my clients think I'm young. I like that part. Uh, my median client age is 74. So I always talk about my friends Peter Paul or uh, Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I always tell people, if you're old enough to get the joke, you're old enough to be my client. And, and their goal is very simple. They've got assets, they've got not huge assets, but they own their own home and they're living in their home and the house is worth about $600,000 and they have, he has an IRA worth 200. They have an annuity worth uh, about 75 and bank accounts worth about 75. So all in, they have about $950,000. They don't have big income, uh, they have so Frank has Social Security of uh, 1,500 a month and uh, pension of five, and Mary has Social Security of 1,000 a month. So their total income is uh, uh, $3,000 a month or $36,000 a year, uh, not counting their income from their IRA, et cetera. But they're okay. They don't have a mortgage on their house, you know. They and their goal is to stay right there. They want they have very simple goals. They want to live in their house till they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. They want to make sure. If that their spouse is secure if they die, and if the two of them have died, uh, then they want to divide things among the kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And, and so the goals are very simple. And, and of course their goal, as I say, is to stay in their house. And who wouldn't? Um, pretty much everybody wants to stay in your house. And actually, the older you get, while the stairs may become a pain, the great thing about staying in your house is you always know where everything is. So if you get to be like me and you're starting to forget stuff, you're not going to forget, you know, where the salt and pepper shaker is. And you're not going to forget the stuff in your house. So as I always tell clients, this is absolutely the right, there's nothing wrong with this. This is absolutely the right thing to be doing as long as it's safe. As long as it's safe. Because, of course, if you're Mary or Frank, what you really want to make sure, you would love to live in your house until you die. What you really want to make sure is that you never go to a nursing home and spend any time there before you die. And as I tell folks, you know, your big, the big danger, and it can be a danger at home, is you fall down and you break your hip, and all of a sudden you're going down that road, and that's a road that often leads to a nursing home, and that's what nobody is excited about. So if, there, if, it's, a, if it's a question of um, um, what can you do, and Jen, I'm going to put you on very, in about two minutes, so you want to stay around. Jen's see gossiping over there, can you tell? Um, if you're trying to figure out what, what you're going to do, the question is, does it make sense to move from that house to some place that is either still close to your home and therefore close to your friends, or probably even more in, in many, many cases, to move to an assisted living community that's close to one of your kids? I just find that that comes up all the time. I remember, I'm so old, I remember this, the first assisted living in this whole area was done in Marlboro in the mid-1990s, and I represented the developer when we were doing that. And I remember we assumed that most of the people living in that community were going to be from Marlboro, were going to be people who were raised in Marlboro and were going to live there. And it turned out it wasn't the case, that most of the people in, a, that, was a that was, was a retirement community, most of, of the people there were folks who were moving in from out of town because they wanted to be independent of their kids, but they, and, but they wanted to make sure that they were close, right? And the, the large assisted living uh, in Marlboro, New Horizons, which was one of the first ones in this area, same thing happened, same thing. They got permitted expecting mostly local folks, but it was folks who actually wanted to be close to their kids. So the question is, if that's your situation, then what do you do? And 
can you afford it? Because I have so many clients who will talk to me about, I'll mention assisted living, and they'll just say, oh, I can't afford that. It's way too expensive. And that may be the case. That may be the case, but it would surprise, it, it would surprise you to find out that in many cases it isn't the case, right? So before I talk, so what I, what I wanted to do, and I talked to Jen about it, ready? And I talked to Jen about it because I wanted her to talk a little bit about, uh, 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 about Orchard Hill and kind of what, it, what you have here as an example. I also wanted you to just mention price when you're talking in terms of what a family can expect to pay here. Because the, the, the is it the right place is a, is a question that only you can figure out. And by the way, among assisted livings, what I also tell my clients to do all the time, when you're at home, you know, you're looking for something to do and it's a kind of a nice day, right? Go to some of these places, make an appointment, go see it. What you're gonna find is that assisted livings, <clears throat> it's like going to college. You're moving into a community and the community that's right for you is not the community that maybe was right for your neighbor or for anybody else, but you're gonna know it when you get there. You know when you do those college trips when you're kids and all of a sudden you get to the one and it's like, oh, this is like, I just feel right here. That's what assisted living is gonna be. Not necessarily because you're gonna move in tomorrow, but the reason why you wanna know where you would go if you weren't at home is if you did fall down and you're at the hospital and now you're at the hospital and they want to get you out the door, right? Because whatever you got going to the hospital, their payment system pays them a fixed fee for whatever they're fixing you for, no matter how long you stay there. One day, or typically one day, two days, five days. So they just as soon make it one day, which is the reason they want to get you out the door. And, and, and so their discharge planner, the first, as soon as you get there, their discharge planner is starting to figure out um, where to send you. And if you know where you'd like to go, well, then that's great. Then you can call, right? And typically, if you've got an assisted living, you can see if there's a, if there's a room available. If you don't, their alternative is going to be a nursing home. They're going to say, well, you really can't safely go home. We're going to send you to a nursing home. So you want to have this in your back pocket. So with that in mind, I'd like to talk, have Jen talk a little bit about Orchard Hill, which is one of those places, when, I'm, when I think about places that are Assisted livings that are people really like. It's places like of about the size and scale. They're small, you know. It's family run. It's close. So anyway, I don't want to do the. I don't want to do an ad here. Jen. <laughs> okay. So um, I've never used this before. So let's I'll, see. Can you help you, me? Sure. <laughs> this is really hard. This is forward. Yep. That's back. That's oh, everything I, I know. I think I have just these two right. slides. Right. So. Forward. Right. And Perfect. It, I, I could yell. I'm from New York. Uh, Can everybody hear me? Ah, uh, be on this side. Okay, I'll be on this side. I'll keep going like this. All right. Oh yeah. Okay. Sit so forward. I do just have this See? one slide, which is very convenient for everybody, including myself. So I've been at Orchard Hill for about two years now, and I am their marketing director. And it's not just about getting the word out of what it is that we do and do so well but we really truly believe in what it is that we do. We, you are part of your family once you come here. So for the people recommending folks to us, for the people coming to visit us, we are truly engaged in what it is to take and make you happy so, and safe. So when we talk about, oh, let's go forward. We have delicious cuisine. I tried to do a little thing on the C here of what makes us lovely. Delicious cuisine. So as you can see, we have a Chinese chicken salad by our lovely chef. That's why she's feeding you here. For anybody who's watching this on cable in Sudbury Cable, that's why she's feeding you right now. That is so you exactly, can test, right? exactly. Um, and we have, on, on e and during each of our meals, we have special entrees. So just like if you're going to a restaurant, we have something that is new and different every day. So even though you're eating three meals a day at this same restaurant, if you lived here, you're still getting diversity in your diet. And our chef is wonderful about thinking and, and planning a menu that any input that you have, we take part in. So um, there's also, we accommodate a lot of different diets, gluten sensitive diets, um, low Coumadin diets. We have um, uh, high blood pressure diet. So there are things along the way that we can do because of our scale. That must be an ice size. cream diet. The there one that causes ice, high blood pressure. That's right. Cause, so we that's have a great unfortunately yeah. a ton of desserts here. Right. Um, and they are wonderful as well. So you'll never feel hungry at Orchard Hill. 
We have a compassionate and caring staff. There is not a resident here who we don't know and know well and know their family names and know uh, all the, the little things about you that makes you so special. And we are truly dedicated to our residents here. We have comfortable common spaces. We're about 20 years old. We are about to go through a little facelift, but we are truly, look, uh, New England bed and breakfast is the look and feel that we're going for. So you'll never get lost in the shuffle at Orchard Hill. Um, and it, there's always a place to be as quiet as you want or be as busy as you want. Most people congregate around our, our sunroom and our country kitchen, just like they would in your own house. That's where people feel comfortable and, and really hang out there. Um, when you look at cost for assisted living, and some people may not know how assisted living works, it is an all-inclusive cost here at Orchard Hill. So it is, can be sometimes staggering to think about the number, but when you break down the number, you're no longer paying your monthly, whoops, you're no longer paying your mortgage or your rent. You're no longer paying property taxes. Um, there's no maintenance fees. You're getting 24-hour security here. You're getting all of your food, three meals a day. You don't have to pay electricity, gas, oil, no utility bills. Um, housekeeping services, we clean your apartment every week. We take your trash out every day. We change your sheets every week. Um, you don't have to worry about lawn care, maintenance, landscaping, anything on the outside. We take care of all the snow removal. No more paying a plow person to remove the snow. Um, no more transportation. We do weekly errands. We do medical transportation to doctors. We also take care of all of the building exterior maintenance. There's no more plumbing repairs that you would have to do at your home. And we also provide all social and cultural events. So when you think about the price of it, it can be staggering, but when you break it all down, it's actually a, a, a huge value to be in assisted living if you're in your home. And that's what we were trying to convey is, even though you've been in a home for 30, 40, 50 years, you can still create that feeling where you are if you come to Orchard Hill. Um, so when we, we look at the comparison of other assisted livings, we are at an, a lower than average cost, and we do give you a lot for your money. So Orchard Hill is also one of the few assisted livings that has an affordable program. There is a wait list for the affordable program, but it certainly allows for people to save up to $2,000 per month on their assisted living fees if they qualify. So if anybody needs information about that, I'm happy to discuss with it later um, about that. And then, again, a sense of community. Just because you move here, um, it doesn't mean you have to stay in your apartment. We want you out. We want you engaged. We want you to feel a sense of family uh, with the staff, with the other residents. And, um, you know, Orchard Hill is a very, very special place. So that, and that's, you know, I always want to make sure people understand that when they come through the doors. And that's my job is to let you have that same feeling. Okay. Any questions for me? Yeah, how much? How much? So our, that's, that's the big, the big uh, rub. So we have studio apartments and one bedroom apartments. So our studio apartments are about $5,100 and our one bedrooms are $6,100. If you're on the affordable program, they are about $3,800 and $4,4200 respectively. So it does save a significant amount of money when you go into those That's programs. That's great. Just so that people have an, get an order of magnitude. And it's also going to fit into the numbers that I'm about to use. Yes. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. You. So go back to Frank and Mary. So whether the place is comfortable to you, that's kind of a personal decision. You really have to see places. How you pay for it, this is just doing the math. And I, and I guess what I, what I really want to emphasize is the goal of this exercise is you've got to do the math. And you may not want to do the math yourself. You may want to talk to a geriatric care manager or someone you're working with about working through this with you, but you want to do it. So once again, there are Frank and Mary's assets. Now they get $950,000 in assets. They've got $3,000 a month in, uh, in income. And as Jen said, that it's, a per, it's a segue into this. Remember, the significance of moving to an assisted living community is that all those other run rate expenses that you're dealing with are gone. The biggest one is the food. It's got to be your biggest expense. The second biggest one for many people is your real estate taxes. The real estate taxes is gone. And the insurance and all that other stuff. The transportation. Many people will have their own car in an assisted living facility, but you don't have to have it, right? Because the van is available. There's a lot of stuff here. So with that in mind, we're just going to kind of talk about how the numbers might work. So I'm making some assumptions about Frank and Mary. Suppose that the assisted living costs about $6,000 a month. It's about right, as far as if you were coming here. That's about right. Um, that means that Frank and Mary um, annually are going to be spending $72,000. Is 
6 times 12. I'm assuming that because their other expenses are now gone, right, or being taken care of, that while they're still going to have money that they're going to want to spend, it's all for fun. So we're going to talk about the fun budget. We're going to say that's $2,000 a month or $12,000 a year, right? And that's, that's, you know, that's going out to eat a reasonable number of times, you know, that's kind of hanging around, it's doing stuff. Which means that their cost of living here, their annual cost, is about $84,000. Remember, their income was $36,000, right? That was from their Social Security and their pension. That means that the burn rate on their money, and whenever you see the term burn rate, I mean the amount that they, the rate at which they are using up their savings to supplement their regular income is $48,000, right? At that burn rate, given their assets, um, um, if, assuming that they kept their house, assuming that they kept their house and, and, and you know, you know, kept the house, maybe they rented it out so that those bills are being paid for, they could stay here for 7.29 years. Now you may say to yourself, oh, that's not long enough if I'm moving to assisted living because I don't want to run out of money. I mean, that's my big client. People come in, talk to me about all their estate plans, and I say, that's all great. But your real question is, in the back of your mind, I don't want to run out of money, right? I don't want to live up past my money. So this may not, this may not be enough, but it's a, it's a great way to start. So now take financing strategy, a financing strategy. One possibility, because one possibility is you're just going to kind of use your money and you're going to deplete it and that's how long you get, it's going to last for. Suppose that you took a loan though on your house, because remember in this, in this case we're assuming that you've kept your house, right? And suppose that you borrowed, because remember it's, a, um, it's a, um, a house on which you could get an equity loan probably for about $300,000, about half of the value of the house. So suppose you got an equity loan and you were paying 4% interest on that equity loan. That means that the interest that you're going to be having to pay is $1,000 a month. And, and you're actually going to have to pay that interest if you get a home equity loan, right? You're going to, that, that's actually going to be a bill, otherwise the mortgage is going to go in default. And so I'm also going to mention at this point, if that's a concern, if the payment is a concern, go get yourself a reverse mortgage. Oh no, not a reverse mortgage, they're gonna take my house. I always hear people who, are who will tell me about this. Once again, talk to somebody about this. All that a reverse mortgage is, to understand what a reverse mortgage is, you gotta understand a home equity loan. What is a home equity loan? You go to the bank and you say, I got this house. And I want, and the bank will say, well, we'll lend you a percentage of the value of that house. We're not going to need to, sh you don't have to show us how your income is going to pay that house because this is a home equity loan. Um, and, and, but we do want to know, and the way the home equity loan is going to work is very simple. You, we're going to give you a line of credit. It's like a big credit card, right? And you're going to give us a promissory note back, a promise. You're going to give us the bank a promise to pay, and the promise is going to say, you don't have to pay anything if you haven't borrowed anything. At the, at the point that you borrow some of the money, it's going to start earn, that's going to start accruing interest. And you have to pay us the interest every month. And then it's going to be due, the, mortgage is going to, the, the promissory note's going to be due when you die, when you sell the house, or after a term. Usually home equity loans last about 10 years, have a 10 year term. But in the meantime, you have to pay us that interest every month. Otherwise, we're going to foreclose on the house. Now, what is a reverse mortgage? A reverse mortgage is the same thing. They go to the bank and they say, we'll give you a percentage of the value of your house. In this case, the percentage is going to go up depending on your age. The youngest that you can get a, home, uh, a reverse mortgage at is about 62. You can get one at 100. People say, you can get one at 100? Yes, you can get a very, and they'll give you the maximum percentage of the value of your house because they know you're going to be dead soon. So they're going to get their money back. I mean, to be honest, right? So you're going to go get this reverse mortgage and you're going to sign a promissory note. It's going to say, I'm not going to pay any interest until I borrow some money. If I do borrow money, there's going to be interest that's going to accrue, right? Um, and I have to pay off the mortgage, which is going to be whatever the amount is that I owe, the amount that I borrowed and the interest when I die, when I sell the house. Actually, it's one year after you die. If you have a reverse mortgage, there's no term to it. It goes until a year after you die. So that if your kids got the house, they'd have to either refinance, which they would do if one of them were going to go buy the house, or they have to go sell the house, and then they'd pay off the mortgage. There's no extra expenses. You it's the same thing as a home equity loan. The only other thing is that if you don't want to make the monthly mortgage payments, you don't have to make them. So if you've borrowed 
$100,000. And the interest at 4% on $100,000 is $4,000, 4% of $100,000. Divide that by 12, it's about $350, $400 a month, right? If you don't make the monthly payment, that amount, the $350, simply gets added to the $100,000 that you borrowed, and the following month your interest is going to be based on a loan of $100,350. It goes up a little tiny bit. That's the only effect. One other thing about a home equity loan, which I, or excuse me, about a, about a mortgage, which I'm going to mention, uh, the reverse mortgage, which I'm going to mention now because I mention it later, um, is that it is due if you leave the house for 365 consecutive days. So if one day out of the year you return back to your house, take an anniversary day, we're going to go back to my house, going to say, you know, visit, maybe have a meal, take a picture of yourself, hello, I'm back in my house, you know, maybe take a picture with the newspaper on it and the date, you know. If you want to be really official, then you can demonstrate if the bank ever asks, which they've never asked, and the, all the time I've done this, um, you can show them you were there for one day. Because if you show up one day, after 365 days, that starts a new clock, okay? So, suppose that they bar you borrow that amount of money, though. How, are you, how you get it, I don't care. Whether it's a home equity loan or a reverse mortgage. You, buy, you borrow $300,000, right? That's going to be your monthly mortgage in payment, and we're going to assume you really have to pay that. Now, Frank and, for Frank and Mary, their income has not changed. Their income is still $36,000 a year. We already went through that, right? Minus, now they've got a new expense. Right? They've got their mortgage, which is $12,000, $1,000 a month. And they've got the old number, assisted living and fund, which was $84,000, right? So $84,000 plus, um, plus the 12, right, minus the 36 equals $60,000. So now their, their burn rate is now $60,000 a month, right? Um, at that rate, because now they've got, they've, they've got, more, they've got more money, right? Um, their assets are going to be depleted. Instead of being depleted over seven years, they're going to be depleted over 10.83 years. That's, they've got, because they've got $650,000 to play with. Remember their original 300,000 that they had from the annuity and the, all the other, plus the extra 300,000 that they just borrowed. So their money is just lasti lasting longer. That's the kind of most basic way to, to extend the time that you have to go to the assisted living. Now, having said that, the point of going to assisted living initially for this short time and keeping the house is you're not sure if you really want to be there, right? And you don't want to get to the assisted living and find out that your house is gone and you can't go back, right? So you may very well want to keep your house for a while, for months, for a year, until you decide. But if you're going to stay in assisted living, well, at that point, you probably want to sell the house because there's no point to keeping the house. So suppose you did that. Financing strategy number three, you sell the house, right? So you sell the house, and remember, the house was worth $600,000. So now you've got $950,000. That's the amount you have, which was all of the cash that you had plus the sale proceeds from the house. Your income is $36,000. Remember your fund, you're, now you no longer have a mortgage payment, right? Your, your, assisted, your assisted living cost and your fund is, adds up to $84,000. Your burn rate is now $48,000 a month. You've got $950,000 in cash, divide by 48,000. Now you're Frank and Mary and you know that you've got 19.79 years in which to live in the assisted living, right? And remember, this is not, this is assuming that you are making no interest or income on this $950,000. This is assuming zero interest, right? You're still in the assisted living now comfortably for 20 years. Now I'm just going to mention um, one other thing. So when you're in the assisted living, one of the reasons why you're coming to assisted living is you want to stay there. Right? Remember, Mary, we're never going to a nursing home. Never, never, never. Now, there may be medical reasons why at some point Mary needs to be in a nursing home. Right? And there are some, and the whole point of assisted living is that it is not here to provide a level of medical care equivalent to the nursing home. That's why you're not paying $15,000 a month to come here because you don't have the kind of overhead in medical services that the, that, the, uh, that, the, that the nursing home has. So, so 
The question then is, what happens if you don't need to be in a nursing home for medical reasons, but, but you've got some memory problems, right? And so you really kind of need to be here, or you just need more and more assistance with the activities of daily living. You all heard the activities of daily living, eating, bessing, bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring. So if you need that assistance, good chance you're going to be able to get it at the assisted living facility. So let me just talk about one other possibility, or a couple of other possibilities. Um, what if, first of all, remember, if you, un under the, the, the Internal Revenue Code, if you need assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, doesn't have to be every day, needs, needs to be substantial assistance in the opinion of who? In the opinion of your doctor, or a nurse, or a social worker, right? According to the Internal Revenue Code. If you need assistance every day, or if you need regular supervision, by regular, you need to have someone around, otherwise you're not gonna be able to live safely. If that is the case, and if your doctor has said that you should be in an assisted living community because of those things, and if that was, even though that was what, what, only one of the reasons why you moved to the assisted, the assisted living community, the entire assisted living bill is a medical deduction, counts as a medical deduction. Now, if you're Frank and Mary, you don't care about that medical deduction a lot because you don't have a lot of income. And the goal of getting big deductions is you get to deduct them against your income so you don't have to pay a lot of income tax, right? It would mean something to Frank and Mary if they're cashing in their IRA. Because remember, that's always, if you're Frank and Mary, the last thing you want to cash in because you have to pay taxes on that money. But if you're pulling it out, if you're pulling out 100000 from the IRA so that you can pay Orchard Hill, and if you need that assistance which is being provided here, then they balance out. The amount you're taking out in the, in the IRA is balanced out by the expense of Orchard Hill. And suddenly, you're not paying any income tax on your IRA money, right? A second strategy, though, related to this, which m most people just don't realize, would be, suppose you took out that $100,000, and it wasn't from the IRA. It was just some cash, some of the cash that you had lying around. Or suppose it was the money you got from the sale of the house. By the way, if you sold the house and you had a big capital gain as a result of selling the house, once again, this medical deduction would count against the capital gain. But suppose you didn't need the deduction. And suppose you really trusted Peter, right? Or any one of your kids. Typically, there's at least one of your children that you really trust, you know? Typically, it's a daughter. In my experience, it's always the designated daughter who is taking care of everything. But say it's Peter. And say Peter is in a, a high income bracket. Say he and his wife are both working. So you give Peter the money. You give Peter the $100,000. Peter then turns around and pays your assisted living bill. Well, under the Internal Revenue Code rules, which also are the State Department of Revenue rules, if Peter is providing more than 50% of all of, the cost, of your cost of living, then he can take you as a medical deduction if you are his parent uh, or aunt or uncle or some other relatives, but for the significant ones here, parent, aunt, or uncle. Which means if he is in a 33% tax bracket, which he would be if he and his wife were making over, I think, $250,000 now. And you may very well have kids that, that to own put together are making that kind of money. If he were, and this is just an example, if he were in a 33% tax bracket, then 33% of the money that he paid to the assisted living is money that he won't be paying in taxes. That's the whole point. Now suppose he were paying $72,000. Remember we assumed that was your assisted living bill? 6,000 a month times 12 is $72,000. And suppose he therefore got reduced his tax bill by 33% or $23,760. And suppose he was a nice kid. And so instead of spending that money, he actually put it aside into the account that he had for you anyway and then therefore was able to use it the following year. Effectively, what you've done by doing, using this strategy is that you have substantially increased the, 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 or decreased your cost because you've increased your income. Because if, you're in, if, Peter, if, if Frank and Mary's income is $36,000, and if Peter gives them the other $23,760 every year, the amount that he just saved on his taxes, that means their income becomes $59,760. At that rate of income, 
Income and plus the gift is 59. Their assisted living bill is $84,000. Remember that? Assisted living plus the fund was $84,000. Their burn rate is only $24,000. At that rate, they can live here for 39.19 years. Not bad. Not bad, right? So I, I guess, and I'm just going to mention one other uh, um, financing strategy number five is simply looking at the VA and the aid and, the aid and attendance benefit. Or if you or your spouse was a veteran who served during a period of war, one day of war, even if you didn't serve overseas, um, then if you're the veteran, you're entitled to a benefit of about $2,000 a month. If you're the widow, about $1,000 a month. I remember talking to a woman named Patty Surveys, whose company, I believe, is here in Sudbury. Uh, and I think we're going to actually bring her in for a presentation in the fall, who told me that, this was a few years ago, that at that time, something like 70% of all the people in assisted living communities around the country we're taking advantage of the aid and attendance benefit. Now, once again, that's changing now because like the World War II generation, everybody went, you know. Korea, not everybody went, but a lot of people. So that's, it's like, it's like changing. But the point is you should be aware of that benefit. And whenever people ask me about it, I just say, talk to Patty Surveys. She's, she, I can't believe she's actually in Sudbury. And she's really one of the national experts in this stuff. So we're gonna talk, we'll talk to her next time. So the bottom line, you have to do the math, right? If, you're, you, what, if you should always consider or have in your back pocket, if you're living at home, where you would want to go, even if you don't want to go right now, to an assist, in an assisted living. Go look around, right? And when you're looking around, it might be a good idea, if you, if you really decide, ooh, this is a great place, but oh, it's too much money. Figure out the math, figure out the math. Any questions? I know we went through quite a bit. Of, oh, and by the way, if you if you if you uh, if I was talking too fast and you want to see this again, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, uh, Elder Law Frank and Mary, and so you can go see this or any of the presentations that I do. Any questions on anything that I just said? So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you in the fall. Thank you, Jen. <laughs>